Yes, one, two, three. Woo! Hey, that ain't no work, Floyd. All right, if anybody wants to hear about the lithium batteries or see us make a nut out of ourselves, y'all come on down here now. And uh, we're going to do something even if it's wrong. Probably have Rick over there throwing bricks at us for us over with saying, that ain't right. So I hope that's not going to happen. Yes, sir. Is it lithium ion or lithium phosphate ion? Lithium ion is what I deal with. Uh, Floyd, the technical man, and I'm going to let him answer it exactly for you. <laughs> okay, lithium ion is basically the common name for this class of battery. These are lithium iron phosphate is the chemical formulation. Yeah, like I'm sure every, yeah, I'm sure everybody's heard about the Boeing battery sketching on fire. Those are lithium cobalt, not lithium iron. So there is a difference. The lithium ion is a general word for this class of battery. Alright, two things we're going to be using today. We're going to be using products from Show Ray or Show Rye, and uh, we're going to be using products from Rich Motorsports. Both of them are supporting the vintage end of the field. There are other manufacturers, but for instance, Show Rye makes six volt batteries, and if you look in their catalog, you'll find listings for vintage bikes. Some of the other ones uh, aren't sure whether they want to support vintage bikes due to some of the things that we're going to tell you all about now. And they don't, you won't find them listed in the catalog, and they'll tell you, if our catalog doesn't say it can be used in your bike, we're not going to guarantee it. And so that's one of the things we've run into. Uh, this particular company is doing it, and I'm not trying to pick one over another. I just picked the one that I was able to work with and was able to give me the answers I was looking for. You might call a different one and get something totally different from me, so please don't think I'm endorsing them. They don't give me a penny. I guarantee you. Uh, I can tell you that I've got good support out of both of them. I have a four-year-old lithium-ion battery and a Honda C102. That's a step through 50. That's the first one I bought. It's been in there four years now. I haven't charged it. It's cranked four or five times a year. Uh, and it's the only battery I've ever seen that could crank a C102. From the factory, you might get two months out of a lead-acid battery cranking one of those little 6-volt 50cc bikes. Well, and that's 50cc bikes. But this one's done great. And that's what got me started losing. But I'm going to let Floyd tell you a little more technical stuff right here. Okay, the biggest thing with sizing the lithium ion battery, there's links to it on the Shirai website. There's links to it on my website where they have a battery finder. Basically, you just punch in your model year and make, and it'll tell you which battery works for your motorcycle. The warranty on them. It was a one-year total coverage warranty, two years prorated after that. I have one in my CB650 that's a daily driver. They do do some things a little bit different from a normal battery. For example, when I go out and ride my motorcycle to work in January and it's 29 degrees, when I turn the key switch on, I have to wait for the battery to warm up before I hit the starter button. If you just turn, when it's that cold, it's low freezing. If you turn the bat starter, turn it on and hit the starter button, it will barely turn. But if you wait a few seconds, then it spins like normal. We have these batteries here that are, these are display batteries. They are actual size and weight of the batteries that we are selling. They all think these can be charged with a standard trickle battery charger. As long as it does not have a B-sulfator on it, you can use the battery tender on them. You can use the standard trickle charger. You just cannot use a charger with a B-sulfator. How would you know if the battery is not How would you know? How would you know if it's got it or not? Well, most of them will say it has a B-sulfator. They say a B-sulfator, it has, it, what it does it every so often sends a spike of high voltage through the battery to break up the sulfate in a lead acid battery. And the gel battery charger would work as long as it's, like I say, it's a trickle charger and it doesn't have any diesel station mode on it. Do, do the battery tenders have the diesel faders on them or not? What? The, the battery tenders? I mean, that's probably 90% of those trickle chargers, right? Yeah, battery tenders are safe for them. Okay. Right. Yeah, the company said they have to, the caveat being, should you by some chance accidentally completely drain the battery down to the point where it will not register, 
Then you will have to use the shore ride charger to bring it back up. Because the battery actually has circuitry in it, a circuit board in it, that is programmed to shut it down when it gets below a certain voltage. So this flows into it. Now this same charger that they sell works for both 6 and 12 volt batteries. It's a little finicky to operate because it's only got two buttons here and you have to make sure you read the directions so that you can make sure that you're charging properly. The other thing is if you get out on the road and say you have a gold ring or an electric light and you play the stereo all night and it's dead the next morning, do not hook it up to a jumper cable. <laughs> That's all it won't work. So that's the other caveat you have to remember. The uh, great thing about it, there's no acid in them. You can mount them in any position, especially if you're like me and you tend to play around on the coastal side of things sometimes. You can mount them upside down. If you have, that's a great advantage for restoration too. Uh, for example, if you've got a mid-80s or early-80s gold wing that's got the side mount battery, you're familiar with the battery acid damage on your exhaust pipes, you won't have that anymore if you switch. The catch is, your charging system has to be up to stuff. Your charging system has to be capable of putting out a minimum of 13.5 and cutting off at something like 14.7 to 15. If your charging system is not good enough to do that, then your bike will have trouble keeping these batteries charged. Their normal resting voltage is 13.1 volts, which is a little higher than a lead acid battery. And one of the things Brian is going to be talking about is upgrading your charging system on your older bikes in order to make sure that it can keep up. And we also have things I assume we have material up here, we're not going to go over all of it today, but we'll be glad to show it to you on how to test your stator, how to check your rectifiers and regulators if you'd like to know about that, you'll see us afterwards. In the meantime, I think I'm ready to turn it back over to Brian now, and we'll go over installation. He's got some parts from Rick's Motorsports here we're going to be putting on his bike and hooking all this up giving you a demonstration. Are you ready, Brian? I'm ready. All right, well, there they are. Here's the scissor. Now, while I'm talking a little bit, I'm going to let Floyd go ahead and be working on this. Uh, as I was showing you a minute ago, this is the way they're going to come packed. They're going to come in a box with all these foam pads. And there's one more big foam pad in Coast Floyd's hand. Now, these things are so small that if I put that battery in there just like it is, it's going to short out on the battery rack. So he's going to have to make us a pad to raise that thing up and pad out the sides so that we can get it fixed. So he's going to do that while we're talking. I tested this bike before I brought it, and that's one reason it's taken apart. I didn't want to make too much of a fool of myself. I took uh, a little chart Rick gave me to pay attention to how, and I'm going to pass this around, actually how one of these systems work. Now, some people think that's a three-phase uh, alternator in there. It's not. It's a two-phase. Three wires, two of them are separate, one common, and that's all it is. In an old system like this, the way they're made to run, is it runs off one coil. Then when you throw the light on, it throws in that second coil. Okay. I just want to make sure I take them down the right road, Rick. <laughs> okay. Now, what we're doing when we put this thing together is we're actually going to be pulling both of those coils together. So we're going to be charging out of both of them. And all that's necessary to do this, well, let me, let me back up just a little bit. There's a cheap way and there's a right way. The cheap way to go to Radio Shack and get a bridge rectifier. Here's one right here. It costs about two bucks. All right. Two reasons you do that. One is that using a solid state rectifier keeps a drain off the battery. A selenium rectifier is going to drain that battery. I don't care what you do, how you do it, unless you take your cable loose every time you park your bike, and I'd be darned if I'm going to take my feet off every time I park it. 
you're going to get a drain out of a selenium rectifier. The cheap one will stop there. There's a better one that uh, Ellis gave me up here that's built by NTE that'll handle, where is Ellis? How much more? 1,000 volts and 40 amps. Okay. <laughs> Don't ask me how quick you could fry a radio track rectifier with that kind of voltage. But this one, radio track, two bucks, that was about what, eight bucks? Six bucks. You know, so there is a better better solution to the radio track one. Now, Rick's cost more, but I have got a solid state rectifier and I've got a regulator. And if you're going to use a lithium ion battery, you've got to have a regulator because they don't like to be overcharged, period. No way, shape, form, or fashion. They just don't like it. And it will actually burn them up. We had, I talked to one gentleman that had one, had two of them in a six volt uh, CA95. And the first one failed. He got another one, the second one failed, and he said he didn't like them. I asked him what his output voltage was, and it was way over 7, 9, something like that. I've forgotten what it was, which would be like uh, 15, 16, 8 on a 12-volt on battery. You can't do that. Even with a lead acid, you can't do it. They don't stand it. So anyway, I went ahead and just did a, a, a real quick switch over on this one, cranked it up, and I didn't have the voltage I needed. <coughs> Show Rob likes 13 one with the lights on. And I was just barely touching it. And I had to speed it up to make it. So what the problem is with this bike and a lot of the older bikes is they lose magnetism in the rotor over a period of time. And if you lose enough of it, you can't get the voltage. I don't care what you do. Now, they say there's a way to redo them, and I'm going to visit that and see if there is a company that will do it. I don't know if they will. But in the meantime, Rick, and there may be other companies, because I have to mention all of them, are developing a new rotor. They've got one they're testing for 350 right now, if I'm not mistaken, and the uh, physical size of it would be the same as uh, a lot of other bikes, the 300, the 450, and some of the other ones. Uh, maybe a little different bore size, that's something they're working on. So in the very near future, I think you will be able to get brand new ones uh, from a company like Rick's. And I think that'll be coming quick. As soon as you do, we beat up the heck out of each system. So I called a good friend of mine up in Spartanburg. He played around. He looked at three of his rotors. He had one that had almost nothing in it in my collect crawl. Uh, had one real good one and one medium one. And he gave me a good one to use until, and I ordered a new old stock one. And I hope that one's going to be good. Hopefully they didn't put it near anything going to suck the magnetism out. So I'll be able to change that. And not hard to change at all. So uh, I did get the voltage that I needed. Nice, come on. Is it up high enough? Yeah. Okay. All right, wasn't being critical. I was just making sure what you were doing. <laughs> That's my bike. You're going to burn my battery up. Okay. <laughs> okay, treat me right now. All right, you got it in there? All right. You want the plug? You got the plug? Where'd my plastic plug go? Somebody help me out here. I know I had it out here just a minute ago. Alright, what we did with the wires, four wires come off the CD-160 and some of these four wires on just about all of them down there. I want it so if I ever have to take the motor off of it, I can do it easy. The four wires that come out, three going to the stator, one going to the neutral safety switch. Now they all go a different place later on, so I went ahead and broke the neutral safety switch wire out of the top harness and out of the bottom harness. And we're also, Rick, then Rick provides a place to put the green wire for the neutral safety switch in that connector. So that way when you get ready to drop a motor, you undo one connector and you've got all of it. Now when we install this thing, where we got Here we are. Boy, y'all can tell how organized I am today. You got my rectifier? Regulator? Right here in front of me, okay. All right, this is the way it comes. And comes with three white wires. It doesn't matter what color those three wires are coming out of your crankcase down there. These three wires will hook good. You don't have to go white to yellow, white to blue, white to green, pink, whatever. Hook one of these to one of those. With the exception of the neutral safety wire, which I want to tell you about breaking that out. 
one red wire going to the positive side is skewed, one black wire going to the ne negative side of your battery, and you're done. And then you don't have to worry about overcharging, you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, provides a much safer, a much more level supply of electricity to it. Now, like I say, you can go with the cheaper method, you can just change your rectifier. On this bike, I'm going to leave the old rectifier on there. Now, it's not hooked up to anything, it's not in the circuit anymore. But if somebody comes and looks at it, well, I got a side cover on it, they're going to think it's stock. They're going to look at it and think I got a stock charging system. It's not a show bike, but hey, it looks good. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it that way. I could take it off. If you want to take it off, that's fine. The good thing about this particular regulator is it does not have to be grounded. If you want to take it, put it up inside your seat and tie wrap it, fine. Well, tie wrap it on top of your frame, that's okay too. Now, realize it's going to have a little bit of heat to it, but it's not going to be bad. It's not going to burn anything up. Uh, might warm you behind a little bit in the summer in the wintertime. That might be good. Sure wouldn't hurt anything. What have I done to you? Small screwdriver. I'm sorry if I didn't bring one. Somebody got a pocket knife or something, I'm sure. You got yours? Fine. Okay. And I appreciate you working on that. Hopefully what's going to happen when we fire this thing off in a minute, we're going to get more than that 13.1 like we're supposed to. And I'm going to show you what this thing, what this show ride battery to do and what the regulator and rectifier are going to do for you. Um, but while he's working on that, anybody got any questions so far? Yes, sir. I'm going to have to come back there because that's that motor that racing real, real loud. Uh, going back to the early bikes with a dynamo regulator and a mechanical uh, Lucas regulator, what, uh, what happens with that? Is that possible with a, a lithium battery? Going back to the early bikes, real early bikes. Okay, I got somebody that might can answer it for me. Rick, can you address that if I bring this over here? Okay, all right. I'm an old Honda man. I can get back in the 60s with you, but Rick can tell you about antiques. Real antiques. Okay, what, what, what particular bike are you talking about? Okay, it's six volt. Yeah. All right. None of my stuff is 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 capable of six volt. So it's hard for me to answer that. But you do have very similar uh, charging system to the uh, to the Honda. It's six volt unit, and uh, it's a single phase. That that unit could be converted to twelve. That you could you could get a good charging system. It, do you have a generator? Is it a generator machine? It's hard. All right. It's right. hard for me to speak to that. I, I don't have expertise in that field. There's On generators. Alternators, yes, but not the generator. Anybody else? Yeah. Can you overcharge it? Overcharge. Yes, can you overcharge that battery? Yeah, you can overcharge it, and then you have a... Uh, China syndrome, the I'm meltdown. Not about the, voltage. I'm talking about the amperage? No, say that not the voltage is overcharging it, you know, 14 volts or 15 volts. I'm talking about leaving it on a battery tender that's just too long. I would assume. I'm, that's out of my expertise, but that's why you, you go to one of these battery tenders that, that monitor the thing all, all the time. It's it it right. I understand. Okay. All right, I can address your battery charger a little bit. Battery tender has got a regular six volt charger. You can use it on one of these. You can use it on the six volt. You know, I have no reason that, that it won't work. Okay? Because it does not have a desulfication mode on it. Okay? Some real fancy battery chargers do. Most of us don't normally buy the fancy battery chargers that have got that. A lot of shops, on the other hand, will have one that will be sold. My local Honda shop, when you carry one in, if you need it charged, they're going to throw it on there. And they're probably not going to know the difference. Okay, but normally what you're going to buy is not. 
Another question I came up with was, how hard can you charge one? Okay, right here on the box. The one we're putting in that bike right over there can charge maximum rate nine amps. Now, personally, I don't want. I have, I can't see any reason to charge one that high. You know, but if you had a two slash six, you could put it on six. But I, I just like to charge a battery slow personally. Yes, sir. I hear the term equivalent cold breaking amps. I knew somebody was gonna pull that one on me. Okay, I'm gonna try. How did you spec the one you put in there? Did you just pick one up at a dealer and say this looks like it'll fit? They suggested. Okay. Oh yes, yeah, it's going to be a lot smaller. All right, now let me tell you another thing you need to look out for on a lithium ion, and you're probably going to need to, uh, Floyd to cover this. Floyd's been using one for three years on a 650, and he has actually got the one that they recommend for my 160 and his 650. Now I didn't tell you to undersize your battery, okay? That's not what I'm telling you. But the qualifier equivalent is equivalent to. And there, there are a lot of terms in there that may not be an electrical engineer will never be able to answer for you. Simply because they talk, start talking about burst amps and all these different ways they measure all this stuff on both batteries. And really, if you've got a battery from a manufacturer you don't feel is putting out like what it should be, you need to talk to them and say, look, this is what I think. Now, let me warn you about one thing. When it's really cold, Turn your switch on with the headlight for a minute, and then go ahead and cut your gas on, finish back gutting up your jacket or whatever. It's not going to kill it. It's actually going to warm your battery up. And it will crank it better if you give it just a few seconds to warm the battery up. There again, I'm not an engineer and I can't tell you why. But it's, it's, it's either got the cold breaking answer or it don't. And I say, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a, and that's when it, but that's when you get the best amperage out of it. I'm Believe it or not. Gold, I'm talking about equivalent versus real. I know, but what I'm saying is, if I go in there to my C102 right now, the little six volt, and I try and crank it, first time I hit the button, it may or it may not want to spin it. What's now, if I go in there and turn the switch on, cut the gas on, wait about 10 seconds, it'll spin it over like nobody's business. So there's a difference, but I cannot. And I'm sorry, I just don't know. LA. Do you want to try that one? You do? Okay, great. The answer is this. The chemistry of that battery is significantly different than a lead acid battery. A lead acid battery delivers its maximum voltage as soon as you turn the key off. A lithium ion battery um, is a bit like an old vacuum tube. It has to have a certain amount of preheat before it reaches its maximum voltage. So if you turn that key on with lithium battery and hit that starter switch, it's not delivering maximum voltage until about uh, 10 to 15 seconds after you, after you switch it on and start demanding current out of it. Internal chemistry doesn't warm the battery up to deliver full voltage until that point. So it's a little bit different than what you normally expect out of a lead acid battery. And that's what they're talking about by an equivalent full cranking amp. I don't know for sure which There's a slight voltage, and that slight voltage is delivered as instantly as when you turn the key on. There's no disadvantage to having more cold crank cranking amps than it's specified. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, an old hot water trick is when we did high compression engine, we would deliberately get a battery of a higher cranking voltage to do that to ensure that the battery the battery is going to be a heavier demand because the starter is going to be working harder. Yeah. And that's another trick you can use if you want to get a slightly larger battery and you want that instant 
hit the button and go kind of thing. Yeah, you can overspec the battery. Okay? Now, I told y'all about what this thing will do on this bike, and I have an old handheld tachometer that you actually push against an object. And some of you nod your heads like you know exactly what I'm talking about. No NT. Lift him on on that one after you give it 10 to 15 seconds to warm up. We'll turn that motor about 150 RPM more than a fully charged lead acid battery. I know it will do that. If you don't let it warm up, it's about the same. But if you just turn the headlight on for a minute, just give it just a, you know, a few seconds to get warmed up. That's when you get your initial, you know, you get the boost. And it will crank a lot easier. Uh, and getting back to your cranking speed, you could probably stack a battery and tell the people, hey, I want one that's a little bit faster, uh, a little bit more powerful than what I took out. And I'm sure they'd be happy to help you out. Because I'm sure it probably costs a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's a term. The equivalent seems to, it seems to sound like a qualifier. Yeah. They don't and, really and, put out this much current. Five minutes later, two minutes, ten seconds, at some point, does it ever actually produce the number of cold cracking amps that it's rated for, or is ECTA different than just ECTA? Okay. I know that. I know. I no, no, I'm, uh, you've got a great question because I, I, you're asking me something I don't know exactly how to explain. I can tell you that all of the amps that little six volt will put out out of a lead acid was 95 amps. That was it. That was all you could get out of it. That's the reason they wouldn't last. The one I've got in there now is 295 amps. And it spends it like nobody's business. You know, it's totally different. But, uh, Exactly how to measure all those things with the lead acid and with the lithium on, I can't tell you because I just don't know. Uh -huh. You can. <laughs> hey, I'm big enough to tell you. I don't know. I don't know. I took out 165 and I put in a 260. Okay. A 260, even after 10, 20, 30 seconds. Okay, the the equivalent cold cranking amp is measured at about 20 seconds after initial current demand. So a lead acid battery probably be on its way out the door in 20 seconds. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's why they call it equivalent. It is measured at startup plus 20 seconds or thereabout versus a conventional lead acid, which is immediate, immediate demand, okay? Yeah. So, so the voltage curves, if you're talking about a uh, lead acid, it starts high, drops down. Lithium ion starts low, goes up. Yeah. So the curves are just off of what you would say. Yeah. That is pretty much what, okay, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know it all. But I know people that do know, <laughs> and we can make some phone calls and ask it. Uh, we are fixing to fire this thing off here in just a minute, I believe. They're just about through. Uh, looks like I got two experts over there anyway. Y'all about ready to start? All right, look, when we get ready to leave over here, I have got all kinds of stuff from, from Rick's Motorsports Electric. I got, uh, I got show ride stuff. There may be a few keychains left over here, stickers, whatever. If you want to look at things, you want to touch things, you want to feel things, you want to see things, come on over here and do it. Feel free. We'll stay with you here as long as you want to. Please don't walk off with my dummy batteries. <laughs> Two of them belong to the Floyd, and one of them I'll probably have to send back to California. <laughs> We've got cards from Rich if you need to call. He's got some staff on hand. And I want to mention one other thing to you. One thing I have found out... This doesn't have anything to do with lithium ion batteries. This is just me. I got lucky enough the other day that I was able to find fairly close gray uh, heat shrink. And I was lucky enough again to find four to one. So I, will, I can find some if anybody ever needs the website. I'll be happy to refer you to it. But you can take a wiring harness with the end still on it, flip it over it, and it will make a nice fairly nice looking thing and LSU probably been using that thing forever I don't know some of us probably have some of you already got it I'm sure anybody ever using it before nobody all right but you can get it two to one three to one four to one and uh, so it'll slip over you won't have to cut connectors off 
or any of that stuff, you put it on there and just heat shrink it. Yes, sir. <laughs> I will tell you that I just didn't finish, or, or I'm in the process of helping the fellow fin finish a CO-77. Up under the gas tank, it has rubbed I into, out of, through the outer cable. And I was able to use some two-to-one and slide it over the adjuster and everything else, slide it down there to that one little bare place, and shrink it and seal it so that I can save that cable for a while. Because y'all know how expensive they're getting. And uh, normally I would say the cable was junk, you know, when it gets a bare place like that, you know, where you can see the outer metal cable. Um, but with that heat shrink tube, you got to look to find it. I mean, it, it matches it fairly good. And it'll keep it sealed, so why not? Black, you talking about? Black. Oh, some cables are black, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, some of the wires black. And you can get other color. I mean, they probably got pink if you want it. I didn't ask for any, but... Uh, and I don't work for that company either, but but like I do, look on there for 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1 to eat drink too, and you can get what you need to splice these things up and cover it up if it's being broken. Heat gun works good. Don't get like me and the first time I tried it, I used a lighter. It makes black marks on it. Okay. I'm a dummy sometimes. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. We're going to get a boat meter and we're going to fire this thing off and we're going to see if it's going to do what it's supposed to. Well, let's check out the resting voltage first. All right. And we're actually going to use a good bolt meter. Well, in the unlikely event that anyone here doesn't know how to use a voltmeter yet, would like to learn, just see me afterwards and I'll be glad to help you. We all have to start somewhere. All right, so we're going to check and see what we got before we do anything with it. Uh, 13.2 is where we are right now. And that's not unusual for lithium ion to read that high when you first plug it in.
And if we have a little stronger one, then certainly we'll do it. Now, as I said, sometimes you can switch rotors. And it's not the stator, it's not any of the rest of it. The whole heart of the entire thing is that rotor. If you don't have enough magnetism in that rotor, it's not going to work. And then eventually it's going to get so it won't work with lead acid, it won't work with AGM, it's not going to work with any of them. So always watch that thing. You can look at your stator, you can blame your, I mean, your stator, and you can blame your stator, you can blame your regulator, you can blame it on all this other stuff. But if that cotton picking rotor doesn't have the right magnetism in it, forget it. It's not going to work. Nothing you check electrical, no way to check it electrical, take a screwdriver or something and check it. Go start hunting for another one or wait on them to get you a better one made. Uh, any more questions? I hope we covered what y'all wanted. Uh, thank y'all for coming. Be sure to stop by and pick up something here. If I can help you, give me a call. I'm in the magazine uh, under advertising. Y'all will find me. Thank you. And for Dick, who also does uh, a blog called Motor Psycho. Uh, if you're not subscribed to him, pick up a pick up one of his cards because I guarantee you it's a very interesting blog. You never know what he's going to do next.